From Cali to Tally, it's time to wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source, and this is Wake Up Warchant. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hudjavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What up, everybody? We're back. Sorry for the one-day hiatus, but not too sorry. I'm Aslan. Corey Clark here as well. It is Wake Up Warchant, part of the Warchant.com family. Use the promo code WARCHANT30 for 30 free days of access to the ultimate seminal sports source, and you also get a nice little discount to Garnet and Gold. Check those folks out, the only owned and operated local uh, Florida State apparel uh, provider here in Tallahassee. So uh, drink it in. Corey, uh, I don't know. Should we talk about Raw? Yeah, let's talk about Raw. Let's get people upset. Well, how was Raw? Was Raw war? <laughs> It was uh, so I, yeah. It was it was cool. Brady really liked it, which is the reason I was there. Obviously, I don't I don't do a lot of wrestling events on my own. Um, but yeah, man, it was. Uh, I kind of got into it a little bit. Um, you know, I had to ask Brady who every everyone was, and then uh, he made a friend, the little kid that was sitting right next to him. They became fast friends. And we're just trying to trump each other on how much knowledge they had of wrestling. But then Roman Reigns came out and uh, announced that he's going to be coming back, which I didn't know he was gone, or mm -hmm. quite frankly, even who he is. Yeah. Um, but he's coming back after a four-month hiatus. Leukemia is in remission. I had to explain to Brady what remission is. Um, but, yeah, man, got to see Ric Flair get uh, sabotaged in his dressing room. Uh, got to hear a lot of loud rock music and uh, see pretty girls and Ronda Rousey. Uh, all in all, a good time, buddy. I had to hear one guy really complain that Ric Flair didn't come out because it was supposed to be Ric Flair's 70th birthday mm. and they were going to have a big celebration for him in the ring. But instead, because it's the WWE, whoever the, the current bad guy is, uh, sabotaged him in the dressing room and knocked him out and dragged him into the hallway. So we, the, the, uh, the celebration was cut short. So are we not going to do a show on Tuesday because you're going to have to be watching Raw on Monday night? To I'm hooked. Yeah, probably. I mean, I guess I can. Re that's another thing, too, by the way. I didn't realize it was a three hour show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was it was pretty exhausting by the end. I was like, all right, good, man. Ric Flair's been knocked out. That's fine. We got to go home. It's 1108. Like, it, this is crazy that you're, we're still out in downtown Atlanta, 1108. But, uh, yeah, man, Brady really liked it. I had no idea Raw was a three-hour show. I thought it was two hours at most. Nope. So, I guess I haven't been paying attention for the last 20 years. Uh, but, yeah, man, I'll tell you what, too, Aslan, those guys are athletes. They are. They're doing yeah. flippy-doos, and, and they they jump out of the ring a lot. Corey. Like, fly Roman, out of the ring. Corey, Roman Reigns played ball at Georgia Tech. Yeah, see, Jeff told me that on uh, on Seminole, the wildly popular Seminole headlines. I didn't realize that. He was a defensive end at Georgia Tech. Yeah. So I was wondering why he did the announcement in Atlanta out of all places to do it, but I, that, I guess that made sense because he was sort of home. I don't know where he's from originally, but he played college ball in Atlanta yeah, in the flats. Did, he didn't play for Paul Johnson, did he? He must have played for Chan Gailey. Or, yeah, he was there like oh four, five, six around that time. No, he played with Calvin Johnson then, I yeah. bet. Yep. At least one year, maybe. That's kind of cool. Reggie Ball? You got to play with the great Reggie Ball? Yeah, the great Reggie Ball. That's pretty, yeah. but so that was actually emotional, man. He was That was emotional when he came back and the reaction. And um, then he came out and actually did some wrestling for a few minutes when one of his, I don't know if it's a buddy or something. I, I had a hard time. Brady was explaining to me. I didn't know what was going on. But he came out because one of his buddies was getting beat up in the ring. And they played his music over the loudspeaker. You know how they do? And Brady went into almost a convulsion. Like, literally, you, you've seen those documentaries of uh, people at the church revivals yeah. where they just Benny lose Hinn. their minds and start speaking in tongues. Yeah, That was Brady when Roman Reigns came out to actually wrestle. And he speared a guy, and the place went nuts, and Brady lost his voice. So it was a good time. Brady enjoyed it. Uh, I, you know, maybe, I don't, maybe I'll go back next year, I guess. I don't think it's something I'm going to be doing a lot of. But uh, still, it was really cool, man. I, I, I really did enjoy it. Yes. Yeah, is this going to be a tradition unlike any other in the Clark family? I mean, I feel like I could probably do it once a year, right? I, I assume they come to Atlanta a good bit. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, he really liked it. He really liked it. And the people around him were even – like, you know, I've, I've talked about it a lot on here. Like, Brady can tell you uh, where John Stockton went to school or what years Hakeem Olajuwon played at Houston. Like, he has a really weird uh, sports knowledge for a 10-year-old. Well, it's with wrestling, it's to the nth degree. 
I mean, he knows who Shawn Michaels is, who Goldberg is, like people that were retired before he was born. Um, Shawn Michaels was there, by the way. That's why I bring him up. So uh, just to, for the Ric Flair celebration that didn't happen. Uh, so, yeah, Kurt Angle and people like that. So it's really bizarre how much he knows about wrestling. It's alarming how, how much he knows about wrestling. Not because I have anything against wrestling. It's just, man, how about, how about getting some good grades in math, man? <laughs> Instead of worrying about when Shawn Michaels was the heavyweight champ. Well, it's because his dad knows everything in and out about Florida State football and Florida State. Sure, he's trying to impress me. There we go. Um, so that said, uh, nothing really big newsy has happened uh, in the last 24 hours or 48 hours since we hung out. So we're going to get right to it. We're going to uh, pony up, as the kids say, or whatever. All right, can we hear the noise now? Is it coming mm-hmm. down the track That's right it. now? That's the sound. There hey, there I have is. a question for you. Yeah. My own Renegade Express question, just okay. for you. What would be your three point when you hit a three in a college basketball game? What would you do? What would be your celebration as you're running down court? Uh, I'd strum the guitar. Yeah, that's taken over here the last year. I would yeah. say that's that's a new one. I've always I've always been partial to goggles. Okay, the the three point goggles. Uh, I think Cabin Gelly does like an arrow, like he yeah. pulls an arrow out of the quiver. Okay. And shoots it. That's a pretty good one too. But I, yeah, I think the the guitar. Would you do a guitar or a violin? Oh, guitar, guitar. No, oh, no. so I would do the violin. Maybe a cello <laughs> or an oboe. Yeah. yeah. Or is it oboe's a string instrument, isn't it? Or a bass? No. I would do a stand up bass. Yeah, stand up bass. There you go. All right, fantastic. All right, real question. Here we go. Captain D underscore sixty three. Wake up, fellas. Always enjoy question. the show. What's your opinion on letting Dugans? Coach the tight ends along with the wide receivers and hiring a defensive back coach. Well, that would involve getting rid of your current tight ends coach, which I don't think I think is a non-starter. Um, I wouldn't mind it. I I don't think Lockett. If somebody has to leave the island, I think Pimpleton should leave the island. But Pimpleton's not going to leave the island because he goes way back with Willie's wife. He introduced Willie to his wife, and yeah, that that gets a job security. So. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but it's yeah, I just don't think that's going to be part and of the also, mix. Also, everybody needs to know, and I'm not trying to downplay or dismiss the importance of a tight ends coach or a running backs coach for that matter. Man, again, or, or even a receivers coach, it's all about recruiting. I think receivers is a little more detailed than that. Yes. But I, I don't think Jay Graham made Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook made Dalvin Cook, man. He was just a, he was blessed. Running backs, as Jimbo used to say, man, there's some God-given stuff that you can't teach. You can't you can't coach every yard up. And so with the tight, these guys are recruiters. And if yes. Willie Taggart thinks that that Lockett and Pimpleton are strong recruiters, number one that he can trust, but are strong recruiters that will get players into this program, whether they're tight ends or not, those guys are are he considers really strong recruiters, and that's why they're on the staff. And I wouldn't have a problem with the. Uh, in fact, I would I would kind of. I think that's what they should do. I, I think Dugan's if they're, you, you know, looking at some of the tape. I actually, I actually have watched a little film of Kendall Bryles' yeah. offense here lately. Try, try to do my due diligence a little bit. They, they really, they do split the tight ends out a good bit. They're not always on the line, and if that's the case, then yeah, man, go ahead, get it, get a wide receiver slash tight ends coach. Let Dugan's coach them all, um, and and get a DBs coach. I, I certainly think, in you know, I have one DBs coach in mind. But if they could get Terrell Buckley to coach DBs, then yes, having Dugan's coach tight ends too would be well worth it. Yeah, man. But uh, again, that's just it's not the way it's going to happen. It's a so, pipe um, dream. It's a it's a it's a wake up war chant pipe dream. It is. All right. Uh, secondly, well, here's just one thing I want to say. Don't um, rebut me. I just don't know. I don't know. If Pimpleton's really delivered anybody. I mean, at least Lockett's delivered. Um, the Pope, Dante Lucas. So, but again, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say anything bad about Dante Pimple. I'm just saying if it came down to it, that's the guy I'd, I would vote off the island, but it's not going to happen. He's staying. I think everyone's saying the way it is. Um, secondly, what position, he asks, do you think most fans are keeping an eye on besides the offensive line? Thank you for all you do. Have a great day. If you want to, go Knowles. Man, I'm I'm more focused. I think I'm going to be focused on defensive ends. I know I think linebackers might be the thing, but I just want to see who's going to rush the passer, man. Who's going to get to the quarterback? I agree with that. I think that's the biggest. Um, I, you know, again, linebackers are linebackers. You, you hope that some of the young guys can play. You know what you got coming back. It's you know, and you hope Emmett Rice can play um, and be healthy. But yeah, I think defensive end man is the is maybe even a bigger question mark than linebackers because you just lost your best one, the sole QB hurrier on the team. 
So you got to hope that some of these guys, the new guys or the old guys, take big steps and become like, you know, good to very good college football players. Yeah. Next question, FSU guy, 1989. Hey, guys, being a father of a three-year-old, I have listened and watched the Baby Shark song enough to cover me for the next thousand years. That being said, I think it would be funny if when Florida comes to Tallahassee and they make a good play where they would normally do the chomp, we play Baby Shark. The Daddy Shark part has the same hand motions as a Gator chomp. Would be fun to see a bunch of Gator fans doing the Baby Shark chomp when their team gets a first down. Now, do you know what he's talking about? Not a clue. Okay, me either do I. I've heard, I've seen Baby Shark mentioned on Twitter in passing, but I have no idea what that is, and I apologize. Um, I'm sure that's a very good idea, and I'm sure the people that know the Baby Shark song, I guess, uh, are probably chuckling at that idea, but I legit have no idea what, what my man is talking about. Who was that, by the way? Uh, the FSU guy, 1989. What was that noise? Uh, I'm trying to play it. Can you hear this? Oh, okay. Let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Rookie baby. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Good morning, gentlemen. Keep bringing the heat on the podcast. You guys are both great. Thanks, man. No, duh. Let's have some fun with a hypothetical. If you guys could add one player from the 2013 team, one player from the 99 team to this current roster, who would it be? Stipulation. <laughs> can't add Jameis. Oh, okay. Can't add Peter Warwick. Also, no offensive lineman. Who would you add okay. under these circumstances? Who would improve the team the most? I mean, I, I might throw Chris Winky in there, maybe. Okay. Um. So he said no offensive lineman either? Yeah. Taking all the fun out of it. Yeah, okay. I won't do Winky. How about no quarterbacks, period? So the 13 team, I'm throwing Jernigan in. I, don't know, well, got- I would say my first incl- instinct is Benjamin, but you already kind of got one of those yeah. in Tamori and Terry, except faster and better. Um, so you don't need another. You don't need Benjamin. So I say Jernigan from the 13 team, and my 99 team would be, who boy, that's a uh, man. Golly, uh, I, and I can't go Winky. Maybe Chris Hope. Oh no, Corey Simon. I want to. I want to do. I want to be. Imagine a, a, a rotation. Well, no, you don't need Corey Simon because you got Marvin Wilson. So you don't want to be greedy with the defensive tackles. Yeah. yeah. Tommy Polly. Ah, there you go. You stole it. That's what I was going to go with. I was going with Tommy Polly. Um, and then from 13, I don't know. I guess maybe Mario Edwards, although he really didn't rush the passer. Um, no. But we need some defensive ends, man. We're good at defensive tackle. I, I mean, we're not good, but. I like obviously no, man, Marvin if, and Robert Cooper. If I'm bringing Jernigan, I guess we're we're doing our own separate teams. But Telvin Smith would be a good one too. Yeah, we need a linebacker. We need a linebacker. We need help on defense. We need help on defense. We're not going with yeah, defense. agreed. Uh, agreed. Especially if we can't use the offensive lineman. Yeah. Here we go. John Henry Jones Jr. Thank you guys for getting me into Florida State basketball this season. This is a very fun team to watch. Yeah. They there are, you man. go. There you go. Uh, could you please explain the rule behind why David Kelly cannot move directly to an off-field position? Other FSU football parts of the internet never seem to mention this, and people think he can move with no problem. What's the intent behind this rule? Is it meant to prevent a recruiting strategy? I that I don't know. That's a really good question. That would be my initial thought: is that you can't just hire well, Corey. a kid's dad. Corey, you know who yeah. knows. Somebody does know the answer to this. You know who knows? Is it Ira? Let's Have go to Ira Schofield. Show? What is the deal with this whole, you know, you, you can't move from on-field to off-field if you had some sort of contact with recruits? Everybody keeps saying Alabama keeps doing it. Uh, what is your interpretation of it, and, and what do you know about this whole situation? Yeah, you know, I don't. the intent of the rule was not to prevent a guy like David Kelly, who's a proven assistant coach, on-the-field assistant coach, to keep him from going off the field. It was more intended for these um, parents of players or high school coaches or uh, mentors to be given jobs behind the scenes. So what, the way it's seen by the NCAA and what we were seeing um, at some schools was they would, they would hire a parent or a coach or a high school coach or someone like that, and then pay them 70 grand or 80 grand or a hundred grand to have a job behind the scenes. Well, how much of a, if, if that job could be, um, not productive at all. And, and maybe it wouldn't matter because you got that recruit. 
what they want, what they put this rule in is, hey, if you're going to hire somebody like that, they've got to be an on the field coach, knowing that schools are going to be really reluctant to hire a parent or somebody who's not qualified to be an on the field coach uh, just to get a prospect. So that's why they did it. Where David Kelly falls in is he it, the way the the ruling is written. Anybody that's had a relationship with a recruit or um, you know, has had some sort of prior relationship with a recruit over the last year or two, if you sign that recruit, that, that person can't be an on, off-the-field coach uh, for the period of two years. Now, w- when David Kelly came on this staff with Willie Taggart as an on-the-field coach, he helped them recruit Trayshawn Harrison. He helped them recruit uh, Cam Akers, all these guys – that not Cam Akers, well, not excuse Cam. me, not Cam Akers. Anthony Grant, Trayshawn Harrison, yeah, I mean a lot of guys who are in this cl- that were in the class last year. He helped them recruit, but you can't then turn around a year later and move him from an on the field to an off the field role. Now, if he had been there for two years, if he Dave Kelly had been in that role for two years or more, then you could do it. Um, and so what's happening at some of these other schools is uh, maybe a guy you take a guy who was at uh, one school and then bring him in to an Alabama. Uh, and then want to put him off the field. Now you could say, okay, he didn't help them. He didn't help them get anybody to Alabama. Right. So okay. that's the exception. FSU did the same thing with um, uh, Damian shoot, Craig. Jimbo, Damian Craig. Exactly. Yeah. When Damian Craig came in, they there was concern that they wouldn't be able to put him in an off the field role. He came in as an analyst. Jimbo's last year. There was concerns he wouldn't be able to do that because. He had recruited some of these kids. He recruited Cam Akers when he was at LSU and some of these other guys. But the reason FSU was able to do it is said, look, yeah, okay, he did recruit those guys, but not to Florida State. Yeah. He was at LSU at the time. This situation is different. David Kelly recruited those guys to Florida State. So he falls in the window of people that had contact with recruits, and then you want to put them in an off-the-field role. So I, I never thought that they were going to get this exception uh, exemption. It doesn't sound like they are going to get it. I mean, I just don't. I don't understand the premise of why they would. I mean, they, he basically, he's not the definition of what they were trying to, to weed out, but he definitely falls into that category. So I just, I never understood how they would get it. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe they still will somehow. But for, from everything I can tell, David Kelly's going to be on this coaching staff uh, this season. I don't even know if we're going to even have any more wake up war chance because that's been the biggest question for the last three months. And now we have the answer to it. So you just <laughs> ruined it all for us. There goes my business model. Thank you, Ira. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Call somebody else next time. All right. See, the thing is, last time, Corey, I had audio from Ira, but it was so terrible that we didn't even use it. So this is the first time that Ira has been unveiled. All right. Let's go to Sosa underscore ZP. Wake up. Uh, I pose a question to everybody. What color jersey they were going to buy uh, of Wyatt Rector? Sosa says he'll buy a white jersey uh, if Guardian Gold has one uh, available. Uh, anyhow, though, he says the wide receiver core will definitely have the biggest turnaround this season. Uh Ira, thanks to you and Ira for bringing up Warren Thompson. He's been slept on. Big body guy. I think he will complement Terry very well. Also, hopefully McKitty and Cam McDonald will be efficient this year because Keith Gavin could not catch a cold last year. You guys still killing it. Can't wait to see you guys with those early wake-up calls next week. Spring ball is here. Well, that makes that makes one of us, Sosa. That just makes... And they need a couple of... Uh, yeah, that's right. The mornings, huh? God, and they need God. a couple of... Uh, uh, the slot guy, you know, you, yeah, you got some big body guys, and I think the Warren Thompson kid they do like, and he is massive. He is a huge dude, uh, and you know what you got in Terry. But you know the the Helton Harrison, you know those guys got to make you you got to have guys that can make plays in the middle of the field, and that can make people miss on little bubble screens and stuff. And I think those are the guys they like the most in that regard. But yeah, man, they got they got to go prove it consistently. But I do think the receivers have a chance to be really good. They have a chance to be pretty dynamic. Yeah, we'll see. I, but they see it seems to it it, it 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 seems like a deep receiving core in like a versatile one. Like there's a lot of different types of guys that you think they could you know, they can hopefully utilize. I just don't don't know if any of them are uh, elite outside of of Terry. I mean, they're all young. Uh, sure. Keith Gavin, I think the verdict isn't on. I mean, he can maybe turn something around. I just don't know if Trayshawn Harrison on the outside. Maybe he will be. Maybe he'll be like a poor man's Rashad Green. Maybe, you know, I think you hope that he's maybe somewhere between Rashad and Travis Rudolph. Uh, you know, best case scenario with Trayshawn Harrison. 
Um, but yeah, DJ Matthews, Treshawn Helton, one of those guys needs to be an absolute pain in the neck for defensive coordinators and and linebackers when they're crossing uh, over the middle of the field. But like what you have with Terry, uh, you know, Gavin Harrison, they'll push each other. Maybe Thompson uh, lines up on that side uh, opposite Terry. I, I don't, I wouldn't think so. But what do I know? Um, but yeah, I think somebody in the slot needs to do something because DJ Matthews did not. Uh, did not sh- shine or flash to, to near the degree I think that we were anticipating. At least, yeah, I but it's also it, we. It should be. It's hard. It's hard when the the offense is so bad and you can't run the ball and your offensive line can't block. Yeah. We hope and assume that that'll be a little better this year, and so those receivers all should be able to make a, a few more plays. They should have the ball more. They won't be punting every forty five seconds. Yeah, yeah, and and it's all streamlined, man. The guy who's going to be designing and. Uh, installing the plays is going to be calling them too. That's that's got to count for something. So we'll see how it goes. Amen, brother. True Noel, morning boys. Y'all got me addicted to the show. Gets me through the morning commute. But you need to stop taking days off. Forces me to listen uh, to other podcasts that knock you guys off. Uh, find something to talk about, even if it's what you're currently watching on Netflix. All right. Okay. That's right. We need to also start a GoFundMe. Okay. I think is our next step. All right. For what? If we get a GoFundMe going, I think we could get. I bet you and I. Like, hey, five shows this week. If you guys fund it, I think we could get a hundred dollars. All right, a little beer, a little beer money, a little CP yeah, dollars. Yeah. Uh, True Knowles question: Which is the better assistant coaching staff, FSU twenty seventeen or FSU twenty nineteen? Bonus question: Same topic, FSU twenty thirteen or FSU basketball twenty nineteen? FSU football twenty thirteen. Um, well. Yeah, man, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. The first question is the I, I would say this this assistant coaching staff is better than I, I think it's. Again, I, I have no. We'll see, but I think it's worlds better than what Jimbo had in 2017. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like if if it's salary cap stuff, um, I mean, I don't know if they're spending as. I mean, I don't try to think. You know, like in a in a fantasy auction, you have to. For fantasy football players, you have to put like how much money you'd be willing to spend on somebody. It's like right. uh, Kendall Bryles is he's boardwalk man, you know, and like Randy Clements is Park Place. I don't think there was anybody on that seventeen staff that was, you know, they were maybe like uh, I don't know Nebraska Avenue or something on the Monopoly board. You know what I'm saying? So, is um, there a Nebraska Avenue? Yeah, I think so, or I don't know. I know there's like an Indiana and in Illinois. Yeah. Illinois. There I didn't we go. Know there was something on the red. Yeah, there we go. That works. Thanks. Corey. Yeah. All right. You got it. Um, next question, uh, King V 99, wake up. I'm really excited about the ACC network and with the launch finally around the corner, I was wondering how Notre Dame fits into the revenue split since they are only a partial member. I would assume that they would get a smaller portion than the full members. Famous people from my hometown of Sanford, Florida, Tim Raines, uh, also Jackie Robinson practice here in 1946 for the Montreal Royals during spring training and also an exhibition game before breaking the color barrier in 47 with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Appreciate all you isn't do. There a, good work. Isn't there a former Florida State player from Sanford, Florida? A one uh, bodacious Bud Thacker. There you go. Uh, how could I forget? Boom. Good old Bud Thacker. Boom. Stole him from Virginia Tech. Yes. Yes. Stole him. What was the question? It was a good question. What was the question? Notre Dame, how do they fit into the revenue split since they're only a partial member? I would assume that they get a smaller portion than the full members. Did you look that up? I did look it up. I could not find a uh, a firm answer. What I do know is before, I don't know how it's going to work with the ACC network, uh, but as it stands now, I, you know, the, the schools average somewhere between twenty to twenty five million dollars in revenue distribution from the from the conference, and Notre Dame got like five point eight million. Yeah, I was going to say, because their football stuff, they, they make all their money from NBC. Yes. I yeah. would hope, yeah, they should get it cut. But, yeah, it should be about – when you think about how much football matters to revenue, like it is it is 90% of the revenue right. or 85% to 90% of the revenue, man, Notre Dame doesn't need to be getting any more than 20% of what everybody else gets, which, you know, they, they get enough money from NBC. They don't need to be taking any from Florida State. If they're not, if they're not going to pony up and be a real member of the conference, which they sh- they should have to be, I I still don't quite understand why Notre Dame gets this special treatment when they haven't won a national championship in thirty years. Um, you know, out you we can say yeah, everybody wants to watch Notre Dame. Man, college football has been just fine with Notre Dame not being college football has never been more popular than it is right now, and yet Notre Dame hasn't been relevant really in thirty one years. I, again, they were in the playoff last year. I get it. 
but playoffs are going to get money regardless. Yeah. Notre Dame's not adding that much to the to, to the viewership of the college football playoff. If Alabama's playing Georgia, people are watching it. If Alabama's playing Florida State in the playoff, which will probably happen this next year, people are watching that. Man, they don't Notre Notre Dame isn't as needed isn't needed that much, so it's bizarre. But anyway, I would hope. Long answer, uh, short answer made long by Corey Clark. I would hope they get twenty five percent of the revenue that the other teams get. Yeah, I think that would be fair. When I get a firm answer, King V nine nine, I will tag you or I'll, we'll bring it up on the show and uh, spill the beans when we get the numbers. Maxwell Gibbs. Uh, actually, real quick, before we get to that, um, tomorrow on the Friday show will be a sit down with Gene Williams, uh, the founder and minister of Warchant.com and Irish Ophel, our managing editor with uh, Jerry Coots, a longtime uh, important cog in the machine of Seminole Boosters to talk about uh, college town, uh, what it means financially for Florida State Athletics, um, and probably answer a lot of questions you have on that sort of uh, endeavor that they undertook, uh, you know, what's been six years now almost. So uh, be uh, be on the lookout for that. It'll break some, down some money stuff. You guys all like the dollars and cents stuff, so uh, that'll be that'll be dropping. Yeah, down. that'll be really good. That'll be good information for sure. Yeah. All right, Maxwell Gibbs. Hey, Corey, knuck if you buck. Aslan, what's good? Uh, gents, I do have to admit, although I have zero expectations for Willie Taggart this season, I have been impressed with the hire of Bryles, Clements, and Dugans. However, I'm still bothered that he won't just cut ties with David Kelly for a year and then bring him back in the off-the-field role. It doesn't make any sense to me to keep him on the field when he doesn't want to be in one to begin with. I mean, it's just, you can't. I mean, you can't. What are you going to do? You can't. Could they do him. that? I guess they could, right? Just say, David, hey, man, sorry, hang with me. Still, don't sell your house. Right. Yeah. I don't we'll we'll know. hire you back in uh, whatever that would be, February. Yeah, I don't know how feasible that is, but who knows. Um, side note, your thoughts on Manny Diaz crashing the Nike coaching clinic and giving away beers to high school coaches. Yeah, so I didn't uh, – they told me about that on headlines. I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, I guess that's – if they if he was allowed to do it, I guess it's, you know, kind of the smart thing to do. Ira compared it to like a wrestling heel. Yeah. Like Very a guy that's just owning it. Very on brand oh. for Miami to do something like that. You know, it, it sounds ridiculous. And if folks, if you don't know uh, the backstory to it, apparently uh, there was a Nike coaching clinic uh, and Florida State had some of their assistant coaches down there talking to high school coaches. You know, you know, they do like a chalk talk sort of thing. They'll have a grease board or an overhead projector or whatever you have you. And they'll, they'll you know, talk about what they run, why they do it. They'll, they'll teach it to the high school coaches. Apparently Diaz and some Miami assistant coaches showed up uh, in Miami gear, and, and Miami's obviously uh, sponsored by Adidas, and supposedly, like, you know, crashed some of the ballrooms and were like, yo, we're going to be over here drinking beer if y'all want to come hang out. And supposedly a bunch of the uh, coaches, you know, the high school coaches, went and hung out with the Miami coaches to drink beer and hang out. And it sounds ludicrous, and it sounds ridiculous, and I don't know how uh, legitimate it is, but I'll always remember that – it's, you know, truth is stranger than fiction or what have you when it comes to college football, because I'll remember back in the day, there was a story that came out, you know, like in 2004, when, when Ed Orgeron took over at Ole Miss or 2005, whatever it was about like the first ever meeting he had when he got the job at Ole Miss, like with the team. And it was the most ludicrous thing ever. It, it was basically like he called everybody into the locker room. He comes in there, tells everybody that like you know, what it's been like here the last few years is not going to cut it anymore. It's a new day. And, and if any of you guys have a problem with that, you know, you can fight me right now. Anybody want to step up to me? And nobody did. And then he said something like, I'm leaving here. When I come back in here, I want half of you on this side, half of you on that side with your shirts off. And uh, I want you to be ready for whatever I ask you to do. And he leaves, comes back in. He takes his shirt off and tells him to start chanting like Ole Miss, Wild Boys, and one side's like, oh, Miss. The other side's like, wild boys. And they keep going back and forth. And then he's just like pushing people in the lockers. They have like a huge mosh pit. And everyone like has this big cathartic moment. And that legitimately happened. And it happened again when he was at Tennessee uh, helping out with Lane Kiffin. So um, these ridiculous stories that sound absolutely absurd uh, are true. It's crazy. Well, hey, man. And, uh, you know, Manny, D Manny Diaz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he he, uh, you know, that's fine. That's a, that's like kind of that's a Miami thing to do. Mm -hmm. That's a heel turn thing to do to go crash. Uh, they're in Adidas school to go crash a Nike event, and and they do need relate. They obviously want relationships with those coaches. 
the high school coaches. So they go in there and it's like, Hey, we'll be there too. It's not, you know, just because we're not Nike school doesn't mean we shouldn't be at something like this. And, you know, they're just taking advantage of the rules. It's fine. It won't really matter in the end, but I think it's uh it's funny at least. Seminole Mike one. What's happening guys. I admire your persistence in keeping the podcast going through the off season. Even the short ones are great to kill some windshield time. How many folks work in the football media department? They've been doing almost as good a job as you two since last year, so I thought they should get some props. I see the Chase videos are back, and damn, they are great. Unfortunately, I just can't get as pumped after watching them as I did last year and then being let down from Game 1. Uh, speaking of Game 1, I definitely uh, did not get the E-Rector jersey in black. That did not work out too well for us. By the way, Ryan to you this week from Ventura, California, home of a one Lorenzo Booker. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, I haven't watched the any of the media, videos. The media department at Florida State, I I feel like it's probably four or five people. Uh, and yeah, sure they they they. I mean, they do actually. They do good. They do uh good videos for sure. And they get you know some people might point out that they get access that other people don't get. But I'm not yeah. one of those people, so <laughs> go somewhere else for that. <laughs> Uh, GSL 7532, good morning, fellas. Do you guys think we go back to the old uniform design with the new logo or change uniforms completely again? And when do you think we see the changes? Yeah, that's been another uh, thing kind of percolating uh, on the boards. have been all these, these redesign sort of concepts that come from fans. And I think somebody even said that they, they heard that it, it might happen. I, I don't know, man. I just – I'll ask you this, Corey. Would you rather get – the old logo back, or would you rather get the old colors back? The old colors. Yeah. yeah. A thousand times the old colors. Yeah. God, I miss that. Uh, that's those colors. Are I, don't, I mean, it was really not. It's like the Charlie Ward, Ward Dunn stuff. Yeah. yeah. Man, that stuff pops, man. Yeah. Go back to that. You had something. I mean, it's still, they're still the best color combination probably in college football. But holy moly, did you have something back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Georgia Knowles, 86 a.k.a. Ranye. Wake up, guys. If you could be the head coach of any of the previous FSU football teams, which team would you coach and why? Who would be your OC and DC? Man. Um, oh, man. Good Lord. Um, I, I wouldn't want to, want to do like a national championship team. It's too easy. Well, I'd like to do one that didn't win the championship to see if I could get them over the top. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking like maybe 14... I kind of fourteen. No, I think no, would no, be good. there would have been nothing uh, enjoyable about that. All the out, all the <laughs> yeah. questions you have to answer off the field. I don't. <laughs> I think you would have gotten run down. I think I know in your personality you would have you would have snapped at some point. <laughs> Dude, how about you know to that degree? Like you know Willie talking about the difficulties of recruiting, the negativity. I just want to be like, what does Jimbo Fisher think when he hears that? Like, oh, oh, really? It was tough recruiting with negativity. Like I had to, I had to coach in season with the New York Times living here. Like I can just imagine every day Jimbo just wakes, woke up in fourteen, looking at his phone like God, don't have anything from Greg or whatever his his you know his right hand man was, and I could just see him walking in every day like like the West Wing or whatever. He's just walking down, and and Greg Robbins is like, all right, the New York Times is here. Uh, PJ got popped for a DUI uh, last night. Um, uh, you know, somebody shot the windows out with a BB gun. And he's like, what right. about James? Somebody stole a scooter. Yeah, you know, he's like, what about Jameis? Nothing from Jameis. Like, all right, thank God. And then he goes, sits down in the meeting room. Like, all right, guys, this is the game plan for Notre Dame. And it's like, oh, what, what's Notre Dame ranked right now? Oh, the number five in the nation? Oh, it's fine. Let's let's focus on this. Yeah, um, it, none of that. None of that seemed enjoyable. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I maybe I think the 98 team is the team I would have liked to coach the most. Probably 98. And then once we got to the Fiesta Bowl, and I we I realized, being the smart person I am, yeah. man, we got Marcus Outson as our quarterback. This is a legit defense. Like most of these guys are going to be playing in the NFL that we're going up against. Marcus Outson ain't going to cut it, guys. Hey, M Coach Rick, Marcus, we can't just drop Marcus Outson back and let him try to slice and dice the Tennessee secondary apart. So hey, Peter Warwick, you're going to be my quarterback for the whole game. Yeah. That would have been the that would have been the decision I made, and I think Florida State has an extra national championship because of it. So you would have kept Mickey as your DC, and you would have just made yourself the offensive coordinator. Oh yeah, for sure. I would have been the OC. I guess I would have gotten ricked after I would have gotten rid of Rick after he told me the game plan for Tennessee. We're gonna <laughs> drop we're gonna drop Allison back about thirty five times. All right, you're out. 
go to Georgia. Oh, um, and then I would have I would have been the OC for that game. I probably would have made myself OC for DC. Yeah, I mean, if I have to get rid of Mickey, then I go. Uh, I don't know where where was Prude at that time. Was God. he still in high school? Yeah, probably. Still though, he's a he's a weird kid. He's a, he was probably <laughs> dialing he, up. Just yeah, he was still you know her, her, and talking like that and and being the being the <laughs> being the guy that he is, but a prodigy. Like apparently he's a defensive prodigy. So even at seventeen, even though he couldn't communicate real well, he still would have been able to get the the message across to like Dexter Jackson yeah. and Corey Simon and those types of people. Oh, part ho. Um, <laughs> exactly. Give me seventeen. I'll I'll take seventeen. And if my defensive coordinator is. Uh, could I have stolen Jeff Collins away at that point? 17. Um, yeah, it's going to be like Jeff Collins in 17, and I'd have Jimbo calling my plays, and I would have just been like the offensive, like just I would have been the, the Willie Tag, like I would have been the, the emotional support animal for like my team, just like, like James, you would have kept here, Jimbo? Man. What's that? You would have kept Jimbo? Yeah, I, I love Jimbo's offense, man. I like it. I appreciate what he tries to do. It's set up. I mean, but, listen. But you're the head coach. Yeah, maybe he tried to uh, usurp my th- authority. <laughs> you think? Uh, you think yeah, he'd he take can't. orders pretty well after winning a national championship? Can't trust him, I guess, right? And having a radio host as his head coach? I think Jimbo's going to be doing what Jimbo wants to do. That's you got to have somebody that's, uh, you know, Give me Lane a little Kiffin, subservient. Man. Give me Lane Kiffin. He'll be my head coach in waiting after that there year. You All right. Give me Kiffin, my defensive coordinator. It'll be um, – yeah, give me, uh, I guess, Jeff Collins. I would, I would try to nab him away instead of him going to Temple. What's the uh, guy that's at A&M now with Jimbo? Is it Elko, the D.C.? Yes. 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 That's my guy. Yeah. I don't know where he was in 1998. I assume maybe he was in college or at some small school. He would have been my guy. That guy seems to really know what he's doing. I don't think it's a coincidence. Yeah. Every Actually, place he goes gets really good at defense. Give me, like, uh, give me Dick LeBeau or Wade Phillips. Give me Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips is my D.C., and uh, Lane Kiffin has my OC, 2017, James Blackman. Um, we still would have done good in the face of all that adversity. Uh, the only man, adversity would have right. been Maybe you beat Alabama. Well. Maybe you'd have taken DeAndre. Um, well, no, you weren't going to beat Alabama no matter what. Well, oh, come on, man. Me and Lane, we know what they're running. Wade Phillips, oh, that's true. them. Come that's on, true. Man. It really wasn't the offense that was the issue, though, beating Alabama that, that year. Yeah. yeah. All right, next question. Cleve Dog FSU 22. Uh, this one's really not a question, but it's kind of a call to arms. Uh, Aslan, Corey, wake up. In Taggart, we trust. I feel that Coach Taggart and the offense will pack the seats, but defense will win championships. I feel that FSU will go undefeated this season. And yes, Corey, FSU will beat Clemson. I think that our defense will be the best in the nation. Our offense will look 1,000 times better than it did last year. I want to know who in the world called Walt Bell the young Bill Walsh. Yes, I am throwing shade at the traitor or Benedict Arnold. I'm glad to see that FSU made an upgrade. Famous people from my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, include Chip Ferguson, Zion Williamson, Lonnie Smith, and the Marshall Tucker Band. Oh, nice. That's a what a quartet. Yeah, man. Uh, that's a nice. Uh, probably Zion will go down as probably the most famous out of this. Lonnie Smith cost the Braves a title. <laughs> um, I feel like there's some tongue in cheek in there. Mm-mm. Is my man really saying they're going to go no, undefeated and have the best defense in the nation? Cleve, Cleve is a he's a super optimistic. Like, yeah, man, yeah. He, he I don't know if he believes it a hundred thousand percent, but he believes it like ninety nine point nine percent. Well, man, that's cool. I, I there it's there's there are people like that in the world which are awesome. I've never been one of those people. I think Atlanta right. sports kind of beat it out of me. Right. Where I used to be optimistic, and then I, I became a fatalist. Um, which isn't a healthy way to live. I think Cleve's way is probably a little better. Although I think Cleve, the first time they lose, will be a little more, you know, heartbroken than somebody that expects it. So there's there's give and take with those two uh, outlooks on on sports. Yeah. But the defense, I will say this: it's not going to be the best in the nation. That that's just not going to happen. But it can be much improved. Yes, indeed. All right. Next question: NYC Noel, wake up. Corey, Panic Pete, what's good? Uh, my question is, will the next baseball coach also have the last name Martin? I seem to think so. We had this talk on headlines a little bit today, and, uh, and I think uh, it'll probably go on until the, it's, it's made, till the, the hire is made. Um, I think you know, the, the point I made on headlines was somebody asked, why can't they go out and get fl- – money shouldn't be an option. They should. It's one of the top five programs in the country. They should go get one of the – 
the top head coaches at, at, at another program across. Somebody that's a proven head coach. Yes. It's yes. one big at a big level, and that should be the guy they they target. And my counter to that, which I you know I, I understand that, is it's baseball, man. Baseball doesn't always work like that. It's not like basketball or football where you want to go where Kentucky wants to go get a name coach. Um, you know, they go get John Calipari. I, it's not like that. Or, or North Carolina goes and gets Roy Williams. Kansas gets Bill Self. It's just not typically like that in college baseball. Again, look who Florida's head coach is. That dude had never been a head coach in his life. I feel like Florida made the right hire. Yeah. And, you know, you look at Florida State's last baseball hire. That worked out okay. And that dude was had all, never been a head coach. In fact, had been a gym teacher three or four years before. I know this was in the 70s. But and then he turned out to be pretty good for four decades. So again, I get that, and I and I don't think it should be Mike Martin or but Mike Martin Jr. or bust. I do think you have to see what candidates apply, who's um you you know who's doable. What, what you know if they're going to be asking for t- way too much money. I mean, I don't think you need to go spend two million dollars. College baseball isn't a money maker, and and not it's just not that big a deal. I hate to say that. I'm a huge college baseball fan, and but. It's just not, it's not, there's not a lot of money in it. So you don't want to spend one and a half, in my opinion, you wouldn't want to spend one and a half million dollars on, say, the head coach at Notre Dame or the head coach at Long Beach State to come to Florida State when there's no guarantee he'd be any better than Mike Martin Jr., who knows the program, who's who's one of the huge reasons that it's one of the top five programs in the country. So I think when it's all said and done, yes, I do think that'll be Mike Martin Jr., I think if his name was Mike Smith or Mike Clark or Corey Clark and he had done what he had done for the last 20 years, nobody would have a problem with it. Everybody would be like, well, yeah, that makes sense. He's been the associate head coach for two decades. They haven't really missed a beat. They're always top 10, top 15. They're always very good. They always recruit well, and they're always one of the best offenses in the country. Of course, this is the guy we should promote from within. But because it's his last name, it's a little stickier. And there's the the Bowden comparisons, but, so I get it. But I, I, I do think at the end it'll be Mike Martin Jr. But I don't know that it's a hundred percent guarantee. And you never know who they're going to get. Doug Minkavich might want to be the coach. So you said his, you said it's his name or whatever makes people feel uneasy. The Bowden comparisons, but if he would have left four or five years ago, taking some you know Ohio Valley Conference team to like a regional, everything feels good. Like whatever. Like I, I think that's the the concern is like he just never went anywhere and, and and did it himself. I mean, but at the same time, people need to realize that he's largely the reason why this thing has stayed afloat for the last ten years. Um, yeah, but, and he he does he is the recruiting coordinator essentially and the offensive coach and does a very good job at both and the associate head coach. And uh, yeah, I mean, I get that. So there's a guy, you, the UNC Greensboro coach is Link Jarrett, correct? Who's a former player. In the last three years, I think they've won close to 95 games. They've had the best three-year run they've ever had at UNCG. They've set a bunch of offensive records. Okay, is that real? If you're a Florida State fan, is that is Link Jarrett really that much more appealing than Mike Martin Jr.? Yeah. As no, far as what no. they will do for yeah. Florida State University. No. I'm not saying Link Jarrett couldn't do a good job. I don't even know if he's going to apply. And heck, who knows? He might get hired. I don't know. But there's, I wouldn't, if I was making that decision, I would have, me personally, I would have more confidence in the guy that's been here for 20 years and has been helping run this program, kind of being a head coach and waiting um, over the last 10 or 15 years than I would the guy that's been in the Southern Conference. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, if you can give me, if O'Sullivan wants to leave Gainesville, sorry, me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sorry. Go, go go, do, you know, you, you made some money or go see if he need. maybe he'll hire you as an assistant. <laughs> Somebody like that, the guy at Oregon State, although I think he might have retired. I don't remember his deal. I don't think um, so. Don't Pat Casey? Is, he, Pat Casey's yeah. still around. Pat Casey, right? Is yeah. he still there? Do you remember? Yeah, he's got to be. Maybe, I, I didn't know, know if, I, for some reason, I thought like he was getting close to retirement or he retired or something. But if he wanted to come to Florida State, all right, man, bring it. But if it's going to be between Mike Martin Jr. and a in a head coach at a mid major, to me, to me personally, that's a no brainer. You're right. You go with Pat the guy Casey. that's been at Florida State. By the way, you're right. Pat Casey actually he did uh, he retired back in September. I didn't realize that. Went out on top. Booyah. Good for him. It's Good. weird how I know so much. Yeah. What I'll say is there's two things I want to uh, try to convey. I, th- I think the one thing is that we don't talk enough about is. Like you cannot take the risk that you let meet go, and then he ends up being a great coach somewhere. 
uh, because right. it's how about that? Yeah. I mean, like, imagine if he goes somewhere and does really well and like goes to Omaha or he knocks you out of a super or something like that. That's going to be a, a tough pill to swallow. Um, I mean, I just can't imagine it's not going to be him. If 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 it's not if it's not me, I I would like to see Doug Mankiewicz. The reason why I don't think it's going to be Doug Mankiewicz is that um, he Doug Mankiewicz is the Jimbo Fisher of like baseball. Like he's no nonsense. All he cares about is baseball. He's really intense. Uh, he he did not get along with uh, the management structure of the Minnesota Twins when he was working in their minor league system. Uh, the players loved him though. Like the players really appreciated like the tough love, the the really maniacal, hardworking aspect of that. But I would just think that that sort of personality is not what this university is ready to take on after they dealt with that as their head football coach for for eight years. But I how mean, do you know all that? I did some research on him, man. I, I read into like you know, dude, he did really well. Like I think four of the five years he was coaching in the in the minors, man, like his teams won their like their division or whatever. And it's hard to get guys up to play hard in the minors, man. They only care right. about making it to the bigs. Like it's hard to win games consistently in the minor leagues. Um, but like he was let go, like he was let go shortly like after Irma happened, and he was living down like in the Keys. And was like cutting down trees when they called him and, and, and fired him, and he wasn't happy about that. It's everything. The GM who hired him left the Twins organization, so there was like upheaval up top, and then they wanted to change the entire way that the things were. Um, and, and they said, like, listen, like what Doug did, like we're forever grateful. He did a really good job of getting our guys ready, but you know we're not going to talk about a personnel decision. So I think it was kind of like a, a, a clash of, of personalities and stuff. But I will say. O'Sullivan doesn't seem like the nicest guy either, and nope. I don't want to, you know, like so. You well, know. hey man, meat meat isn't a teddy bear. Yeah, that's true. I don't think the players would be like. I don't know that uh, players' coach is overrated, overrated anyway. I don't know that you'd call him a players' coach. I mean, right. he's yeah. he's kind of a hard a little bit or hard butt. I guess we don't. Well, I don't, hard butt sounds awful. I, I'd rather say hard. Ass. Um, he's got a little bit of that in him. I don't think he's he's uh you know puppy puppies and puppy dogs and rainbows. Right. Uh, and, and I don't. I don't think you have a lot of those in baseball. Quite frankly, yeah, O'Sullivan definitely is it. And I would say this real quick about Mead about not coaching anywhere else. You know, the Georgia job came open maybe four years ago, five years ago. I don't remember. Um, and I know Mead was a candidate. And I really do think if his name wasn't his name, I think he would have had a pretty legit shot at getting that job. Because of, of all the references he would have had, the people that would have sworn by him, the people that would have let the Georgia administration know how vital he was to Florida State's perennial success. But if you're Georgia and it's 2000, whatever it was, 14, would you hire Mike Martin Jr. knowing the age of Mike Martin Sr.? That's a good question because I've I've battled that because I know uh what what's like FSU Geo like that's the 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 guru of baseball yeah on he's Warchick. definitely the guru of Florida State on online online baseball fans yeah so like he he was saying that you know Meats put his name in and he's he's tried to get a lot of places he just hasn't had the offers I do think about that though because I I don't know does an AD want to does AD think he's gonna hire a baseball coach and then like that's the only guy's ever gonna hire during his tenure. I mean, like, why wouldn't you take meat for four years? Like, isn't Mike Martin Jr., if he's if he does everything he did at Florida State, isn't he good for your organization, your institution, your program for two years? And then he does come back home, and then, then you're in that much better of a place. Yeah, but not at can... a Georgia. A Georgia ain't looking to hire a guy for two or three years. A smaller school like a South Alabama or a Troy, yeah. uh, sure. But again, I think they're scared away a little bit by that. I And, and it's always been so unknown with Mike Martin Sr., yeah, we've not, he's been old for a long time. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like like Sparky Anderson was old my entire childhood into my uh, you know thirties. Yeah. He was just an old dude, and uh, there's just people like that. And I, he's always been an old guy that I'm sure they've they've thought about. I mean, I know he hasn't always been old, but in the context of college baseball recruiting circles for the last ten or fifteen years, he's been considered close to retirement. When's he going to retire? We don't know. When's the old man going to call it quits? We don't know. And so I think that was always something that worked against me when he was trying to get other, Mike Martin Jr. when he was trying to get other jobs. Sorry, everyone, that I keep calling him Meat. I, yeah. It's a it's an odd nickname. And if he does get the head coaching job, is Florida State really going to have a head coach nicknamed Meat? I mean, I guess they will. I mean, they got a guy eleven at least is something you know you can you know you can tolerate that a little bit. 
um, I don't know about meat being the head coach, but anyway, as a nickname for your head coach, but I, I do think that the, these other schools were scared off by that because they knew if he did well for a couple years, he's immediately going to Florida state. If, if, and when his dad retires. Yeah. So I, I just think that's another element to it. I'm not saying it's, um, ideal. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have gotten another job, and that's not an excuse that he hasn't been a head coach somewhere else. I also think there's a point to it that he wanted to make sure that Florida State stayed on top because his dad was the coach. It means a lot to him. Yeah. You know, I don't know how seriously he pursued every job that came available over the last decade when he's been one of the you know better assistant coaches in the country. I think Florida State baseball mean, obviously means a world to that family, and he wanted to make sure it stayed somewhat on top so his dad wasn't going out like Bobby Bowden went out. Yeah. And I think that's kind of commendable. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying it was all, you know, uh, uh, out of the goodness of his own heart that he's not a head coach elsewhere, but him being at Florida State is the reason that Florida State, not is the reason, but it's one of the reasons that Florida State has still been so good for so long. Yeah. All right, here we go. Last one. Rully for FSU. Wake up. All right, Corey Aslan, help the Tribal Council settle this one. You can build your offense around one of these former Florida State running backs. Who you got between Warwick Dunn and Dalvin Cook and why? Here's his explanation. I love them both. I find it difficult to choose one over the other, but think I have to give the edge to Dalvin. He single-handedly won games for us behind a woeful O-line while nursing nagging leg injuries. Dunn, although incredible in his own right, was one spoke on a very talented wheel of players. That being said, it would have been fun to see what Dunn could do with a similar number of carries per game. Dunn will always be remembered for the play, as well as being perhaps our greatest ambassador off the field. Ward to Dunn will live in infamy among the fan base, so he's got that going for him, which is nice. Yeah, no, I, I, Ward Dunn's uh, done very well for himself by Florida State um, in the in the Florida State Pantheon. I would probably go with Dalvin, too. I never thought I'd say that. Um, I think Dalvin is the guy. I think he's better than Warwick Dunn, which kind of pains me to say because I loved Warwick Dunn. He was awesome to watch. Um, but if you go watch Warwick Dunn highlights, if you can, well, they're on YouTube. I was going to say if you can find them, but they're there. <laughs> Look, check out the holes that my man was running through. There were a lot of time. Now, he averaged seven yards of carry, and he was awesome, and I'm not dismissing him at all. But there were a lot of times where there was nobody near him until he was seven yards downfield. And then think about the people that had to block for Dalvin Cook or tried to block for Dalvin Cook. I just think if you put, can you imagine Dalvin Cook in the 1995 Florida State offense? That would be good. Against that competition with that offensive line blocking for him, with all those weapons everywhere else, holy moly. <laughs> I'm going to say work done, man. I, I don't just know. Just to maybe... be a contrarian, I got you. No, I just... I don't remember like war. I mean, obviously, I guess everyone's going to yell, but like Virginia, the Virginia game. Like he never, he did no wrong. Like I feel like any time he got handed the ball, he got seven yards. Like it was just, all right, yeah, hand the ball off to work done. And any situation is going to get you six or seven yards a clip. Um, I just, that's the way I always think about him. With Dalvin, I, I think about home runs, but like I, I think of 2015 Death Valley getting stuffed on fourth and one. I think of Pasadena and that meltdown. And uh, <laughs> man, what a, a harsh critic this guy! I'm just you don't saying, think about the Orange Bowl or the Florida games. I mean, those games don't matter if you ask the people who don't like Jimbo, right? They'd be like, "Ah, who cares? Florida sucked. Miami was terrible. He should have won those games. Who cares about Michigan and the Orange Bowl? Doesn't mean anything. It's not the playoff." So uh, I'll use their uh, misguided sort of barometer. It's, love a Dalvin. it's a tough one. It's Listen, a tough love one, Dalvin. Right? Are... Absolutely love Dalvin. I mean, I, I was here as a civilian in 16 against Clemson and just, I mean, just him ripping off all those runs was just, I mean, the way you just you had to hold your breath anytime he, he got the ball because you're like, it could be it. I, I remember in 15 in Clemson, I remember being at a bar in St. Pete and it, it was the first play of the game, right? Where he just gone. Yeah. And I, I remember everybody, play, but I was at a Florida, to it. I was at a Florida state bar and everyone's going crazy, and there was a flag, and I'm like, everyone, chill out, chill out. It's freaking holding. It's coming back, and it was like offsides, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it just, yeah. I mean, he gave you that, that sort of just thrill of your edge of your seat any single time that he he carried the ball. Uh, but I don't know, there's something about work done, man. Just he, he just couldn't tackle him, man. Like it's it, it was it was crazy to watch. It just it was a good thing. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he they, they were both they were both awesome. It really is hard to pick. I, I 
Uh, and, and Warwick Dunn, I think, you know, Dalvin Cook broke his rushing record in three years and Warwick Dunn played four. But I think Warwick Dunn would point out that Dalvin Cook had more carries um, in his four years than – or in his three years than, than Warwick Dunn had in four. The best story, I think I think it's true. It might be legend, but I think it's true that when, when the Buccaneers were interviewing Warwick Dunn at the Combine or maybe at a, you know, a, the Pro Day when they were thinking about drafting him and they said, what do you do best on a football field? And his answer was, I score touchdowns. I mean, you can't get a better answer than that. And that dude, and I know, I remember, I remember specifically a Monday night football broadcast, maybe Dunn's rookie year, when the broadcasters were talking about talking to the Tampa Bay GM or the management about Warwick Dunn. And they're like, yeah, the coaches at Florida State said he's the best they've ever had. And in, not running back, the best player they've ever had. Yeah. And remember, this was like 97 Florida State, 96 Florida State. They had nothing but awesome players. So, again, that tells you how good that dude was. And so maybe it's recency bias, um, but, man, just Dalvin Cook was a, of another world. And I wanted to point out real quick because I did, again, I don't. I only mentioned headlines because it was earlier or it was yesterday that I had to do this, you know, all this talking, so much talking, Aslan. Um, but you know how many guys Florida State has in the combine this year? Three. You know how many they had four years ago? Was I right? I think so, yeah. That's what they said. It's Demarcus Christmas, Burns, Burns and Nyquan. Nooney, yeah, that sounds right. So, really, they have one for sure draft pick. Yeah. yeah. Four years ago, I only remember this because I was up there because it, they had – it was Jameis. Jameis was, Jameis was coming out. So, it was Jameis, Trey Jackson, go down the line, all of them. Cam Irving, um, Mario Edwards. Darby, PJ, well, all of them. They had like 12 or 13 guys there. And now, just four years later, they have three. And two of them are fringe guys. Yeah. You know, two of them might not get drafted. What happened? You know, and we can blame Willie all we want because Willie did not do a good job. Nobody can argue that. But what happened to the NFL pipeline? It straight up dried up. Well, isn't that know, like when you really take a step back and think about it, it, that was only four years ago. That's not that long ago. They had those 29 draft picks and now they're going to be lucky to have like nine draft picks in three years or 10 in, in half of those are in the seventh round. You just wonder. And again, I'm not blaming it all on Jimbo. A lot of good times there in this staff that that's currently in place. Hasn't proven anything. Jimbo Fisher and that staff did. And they got guys to the NFL, and they had that great run. But what happened that now Florida State has one non-fringe guy at the Combine? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe he just wasn't, you know, it's uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's a total rhetorical question. It just it has to come down to, I don't know, I mean, the personal life stuff, the getting too fat um, after winning a national title, maybe not looking at, at hard as uh, as you did on tape you just kind of start trusting lists and um you know word of mouth stuff i mean yeah someone has to explain why because that guy uh, knows how to identify talent i mean he did it forever um and then it 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 quickly dried up and we'll never know and it felt like they won a lot of those recruiting battles i mean obviously those recruiting classes were high and yeah. people wanted um you know, a lot of the guys that they got over the last three or four years, they they were beating real big time schools for these kids. But I don't know if it was the player development. You know, I I was not a fan of his coaching staff at the end. I didn't. That certainly wasn't the best that Florida State could do. Yeah. Was Bill Miller and Rick Trickett and the like. Um, I think that had something to do with it. But so it's some of its development. But man, I don't know if it was an eye for talent that kind of he just got blinded by some stuff or wasn't really into it or trusted the wrong people or got unlucky. But man, it's really a lar- It's really kind of startling when you when you think that you know I was in Indianapolis this time four years ago in minus two degrees. My Surface car city. temperature said minus two when I got in it. Um, in in and, and going there every day and talking to three or four Nick O'Leary, talking to three or four different guys a day, um, uh, and including the number one pick in the draft. And then here we are four years later, and they have one guy. They might just get one guy drafted. It's just, you know, it's time to get it back, baby, is what I'm saying. Are you with me, Aslan? Let's do it, man. Uh, Are you with me? I want the 2021 combine to have 11 Florida State kids in it. All right. We'll be there. 
You and I in Indianapolis. We will be there. Wake Up Board Channel will be broadcasting live from Indianapolis if they have 11 guys in 2021. There and we we're all live. You heard it here first. Oh, don't forget, folks, that tomorrow, again, Gene Williams, Irish O'Fell, uh, will be joined by Jerry Coots, a longtime um, instrumental member of the Seminole Boosters organization to kind of talk about finances and we'll give you the lowdown on that. Uh, we're done for the week, though. But, again, there will be a show for you tomorrow. We promise. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening. Have a great one, everybody.